Well, welcome to worship. Uh, as we begin our time of worship today, we want to just take a few extra special moments uh, to recognize God's creation, uh, to be thankful for what He has done. And with it being Mother's Day, uh, we are thankful for the women in our lives and how women are created and made in God's image and for the role that they have played in our lives. Each of us would not be the people that we are today uh, without the significant women in our lives. A verse that I've been thinking about recently is Psalm 68, 6. And it says that God puts the lonely into families. And I know for me personally, if it wouldn't have been for the women in my life who saw my lonely and wandering soul, I would have never been put into a family. I would have never been put into God's family. So today, on this Mother's Day, we, we recognize all the women who are a vital part of God's kingdom. All the women that are both biological moms, uh, adoptive moms, uh, the aunts, the grandmothers, the cousins, the best friends, all of you all have played a significant role and you continue to play a significant role here. And we recognize that Mother's Day, it comes with all kinds of emotions. It comes with enjoyment and excitement, disappointment, grief. It comes with all of that. And so today, as we worship God, May you know today, all of the women that are here, may you know that you are created in God's image, uh, that you are special, you are wonderful, and you are magnificent in God's eyes and in our eyes today. So may we worship God today, being thankful for the gifts uh, that we have had in our lives. So let's please stand, and let's begin our time of worship through song this morning. Good morning, Woodland. Wow, I'm turned up. A new song for you first thing this morning. You may have to put your seatbelt on uh, because we're going to get right after it this morning. But happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. Enjoy. I hope these songs touch your heart.
can sing now. glad that you're here to worship with us at Woodland. If I have not yet met you, my name is Karen Daniels. I'm the children's minister here, and I would like to invite you to please join me in prayer. Holy God, we gather this day with many thoughts and distractions. Help us, God, to focus this time on you. Help us to pause and reflect. Help us to reflect on your great love for us. Help us to reflect on our hearts and help those two things, your love and our hearts, mesh together in a way that allows us to feel your very presence. God, we thank you for our mothers, for those who are like mothers to us. Thank you for blessing us with women in our lives who have poured into us in ways that help us reflect you. God, for those who need your healing power emotionally, physically, spiritually, we pray for healing and comfort for those who need strength for those who need patience for those who need answers we pray for your provision and we acknowledge your presence in those situations and in our hearts may our time together be a blessing to us and to you May our words and actions be pleasing to you. And may our worship be for your glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Hey everyone, I'm Kiwi and I'm the Discipleship Minister here at Woodland. We wanted to take some time this morning to celebrate you as a woman of God, all the women in our church. We hope that today you feel seen, cared for, and loved. We know that Mother's Day can bring a lot of different emotions for different ones of you. Some of you have incredible moms, and today is an awesome day to celebrate your mom and to love on her. For some of you, you may have a challenging relationship with your mom, and sometimes you're grieved by unmet expectations in your relationship. For some of you, your mom's no longer here, and you miss the time that you used to spend with her. For others, you long to be a mom, but that desire has not yet been met. For some, you've gone through the heartbreaking loss of losing a child and you grieve what could have been. And for others, there's many other reasons why today is hard. Wherever you find yourself, we want you to know that you're not alone. We care about you. We desire for you to feel seen and celebrated as a woman of God. We were able to gather a few women that I love and respect to answer a few questions, to hopefully be an encouragement to you today. As they take time to answer these questions, we hope that it ministers to your heart of hearts. Peggy, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, what opportunities has Woodland provided you to serve as a mother figure? Well, I've always enjoyed working with young families, and that is where I've ministered most of my adult life. About nine years ago, I was called to start a preschool ministry here at Woodland, and each and every day when I greet the parents and grandparents at the doors, I always look into the faces and look for signs of someone that might need a hug mm -hmm. or just an encouraging word. How have you been blessed by other women here at Woodland? Uh, I think the biggest blessing that I've received is the blessing of encouragement. Every day when I walk through the doors, whether it be the weekday preschool ministry or Wednesday night Awana or Sunday mornings, I feel like the women in this church have encouraged me and prayed for me in everything that I've done. And I feel like that has made the ministry successful and it's also made it a blessing to me. If you could encourage other women in the truth of who God says that they are, what would it be? Um, I'm going to look directly in the eyes of women when I say this, because some of you have heard me say this before. You are a beautiful woman of God. Don't ever forget that. You were created in His image. You are a beautiful woman of God. Amen. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is true. Um, what scripture helps you believe the truth about your identity? Christ. Oh, that's a hard one. There's so many good scriptures. Um, obviously, John 3.16 sums mm -hmm. it all up, but one of my favorite ones is Ephesians 2.10. And can I just read that? Yes, please. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Just remembering that I was created by God. That's my identity. I was created by God. And I was created for God, not for myself mm -hmm. or for the people that I serve, but I was created for Him. Amen. So, Morgan, can I ask you a few questions? Of course. Awesome. <laughs> First question is How has Woodland helped your growth as a Christian woman and mother? It's a good one. Um, I've only been a part of Woodland for about a year now, so I've been making a lot of new friends and joined the women's group on Wednesday nights. And I think that's really helped me grow as a Christian woman and mother, um, meeting you, PV, and um, just getting to know the moms and hearing their testimonies and how they get through the daily grind of motherhood and you know relying on their faith to get them through the hard days and the good days. Question, how have you been blessed by other women at our church? Um, looking in this room and to see friendly faces, welcoming faces, and know that, you know, I'm here for a reason and Woodland has just provided that for me and, um, and joining, you know, the moms group, like I just said, is just such a great opportunity to grow in my faith and I know I'm not alone in this journey. How have other women at our church invested in the lives of your kids? This lady sitting right here. Miss <laughs> um, Peggy has been such a blessing from 
the day I met her, um, probably a year and a half ago at uh, preschool, at a preschool tour, um, and just getting to know her and the dedication she provides my kids and the whole preschool on a daily basis amazes me. And I'm very thankful for you and the place you provide our kids. What scripture helps you believe the truth about your identity in Christ? There's a lot, um, but I picked one that I thought really spoke to that question. Um, and I'll read it now, Romans 15, 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that just um, really speaks to my identity that, like I said, you're never alone and that we're, He is our source of hope and He is our everything. And like Peggy said, our existence. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Sure. 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 All right, great job, TV. Let's all stand and sing about God's grace. Your grace is enough.
All right, everybody should know this next one. Come thy fountain. Being a member um, of Woodland for a very long time, I think we're coming on um, 23 years, uh, there are a lot of examples of how that has been fulfilled. Um, but having a mother that is not close by um, has provided an opportunity that women have stepped up in our church and fulfilled. Um, there are women in this church that uh, can read my face mm -hmm. and know just when I need a hug. Uh, there are women that know when I'm having a hard week and I get a card in the mail. Um, so just simply the way that women have stepped up to fill that mother role because mine is not close by. What impact has a woman in this church specifically had on your life? <clears throat> Encouragement. Mm -hmm. Um, again, there are many women in this church uh, that are filled with the truth, mm -hmm. um, that walk showing that light. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's encouragement to me when I am having a struggling day, mm -hmm. uh, but it is also encouraging for me as a mother to follow their example so that I too may be that person mm -hmm. one day. How has God helped you invest in the lives of others? Because I've realized the gift. Hmm. Um, simply realizing the gift of what he's given and that it is nothing that I have done encourages me to share his word. If you could encourage someone in the truth of who God says that they are, what would it be? My encouragement would be uh, for you to realize uh, that you are an ingredient in a recipe. Hmm. Um, so when we as women often get into the kitchen and we have a recipe and that recipe includes a list of ingredients, hmm. um, it then tells us what to do with those ingredients um, and the baking time. And I view that as that is what God does. He's the master chef with our life. He takes all the ingredients he's given us. He takes the ingredients we tried to choose as a substitute and he mixes all of that together 
to come up with a result that is beautiful. But even further than that, for the woman that's struggling today, we are the ingredient mm -hmm. that God made us to be, knowing absolutely every piece of grit. You can consider baking grease. Mm -hmm. So baking grease, if you look at it, is a leftover. Mm -hmm. It's a waste. But if you're from the South, baking grease is gold. <laughs> I mean, it is worth saving. And that ultimately is how God sees us, is that even with the leftovers, even with the grit and the dirt, we are worth saving. How has the body of Christ helped you grow as a Christian woman? So church for me has been the family that comes alongside of us and, or for me, and supported me in um, a lot of difficult times and um, also in a lot of times in my life where it was a great joy or a celebration. And it also has provided me a place to serve and um, study. Mm -hmm. And the study part is really my heart. And the study part is, has helped me to grow and to, um, to help others to grow too. If you could encourage someone in the truth of who God says that they are, what would it be? You're His. I mean, you will always be His. And nobody can add to that and no one can ever take away from that. There's nothing more someone can give you to make you anything greater than God has already made you because you're His. Amen. <laughs> uh, what scripture helps you believe the truth about your identity in Christ? So I have, um, I've got one scripture and it's kind of my life scripture and it's 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and it says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And too often our days are spent wondering, how am I, to, how am I gonna get this done? How can I accomplish this? Why didn't I do this yesterday? Why didn't I say this? And it always brings me back to this, where God's saying, you know what? I got it. Mm -hmm. You're not in control as much as you want to be in control some days, but that's a good thing mm -hmm. because he's got it. What has helped you to walk in your true identity as a daughter and child of God? Um, probably small groups, meeting with other women, doing Bible study, having people to share their stories with me, like what you just shared a moment ago. Um, that helps being a part of a, a community of Christ where people struggle with real life things every day and they're there to encourage you and to tell you maybe how they got through that same kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Today, we rejoice that in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. That you bear the image of God. You are loved beyond measure. You are seen, sought after, accepted, treasured, set apart, forgiven, never alone, made alive and redeemed. You are valuable, more precious than gold and any treasure on this earth. You are irreplaceable, unique, chosen, gifted, cared for. You matter simply by being you. So today and always, we hope that you know that you are loved, you are lovely, and you are lovable. Well, and all those things are so true. Um, so happy, happy Mother's Day to you. Thanks for being here today. And take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 
uh, and we'll turn to chapter 3 of the book of Revelation today, or excuse me, chapter 2, as we continue through this uh, book. And uh, just again to reiterate um, how uh, thankful we are for God's work, not just in our homes, but in our, in our church um, with providing both men and women who love Jesus and who walk with Him. And we're thankful that God has designed the church in such a way that we have not only uh, fatherly figures, but motherly figures as well, and are absolutely necessary for us to, to be the family of God, for us to be the people that God would have us to be. And thank you to so many of you who have given of yourself just tirelessly um, in order to serve in that way. Um, and thank you for the, the love that you show for Jesus, most importantly, and for other people as well. And uh, what a delight it is to remember the, the goodness of God in so many uh, different ways. So we've been walking through the book of Revelation uh, together, and we saw that Jesus has written uh, letters to the seven churches. And we've seen in the book of Revelation that the word seven means kind of to all of them. In other words, that these seven churches that Jesus, or letters rather, that Jesus writes are for every church at all times. And so we want to listen to these and hear these because they shape for us how we're supposed to live our lives as Christians. When we think about a day like Mother's Day where we're remembering the, the motherly work that the church does on our behalf, uh, we can't lose sight of the fact that God has empowered us to fulfill that responsibility. That it's not just that He's kind of laid out for us, well, you need to go and care for one another and love one another, but He has uh, given us the way in which this can happen. And it's the, the Spirit of God and the Scriptures of God that His Spirit indwells us and lives within us as believers, that He empowers us, that He leads us, He guides us, He uh, inspires us to do the things that God would have us to do, and then He's given us His Scriptures where He speaks to us. It's His voice, the, the very voice of God. When we open up the Bible, we hear God talking. Sometimes we, we might encounter people who think, man, I really wish I could hear God say something audibly. And so what you need to do is then just read the Bible out loud, and it'll be God speaking to you audibly, because that's the place where He speaks to us. And so God hasn't left us on our own to figure out how are we supposed to live, and what are we supposed to do, and how do we accomplish His will. There are so many areas in our lives where our relationships might lead us to, to ask questions like, how can I ever do this right? How can, can I ever overcome my failures or my weaknesses? And how can I ever live up to what I'm expected to do? And uh, even days like today, we think, well, you know, here's an amazing mom over there. And, uh, you know, can I ever match up with the way that, that she lives? Or, you know, my mom was incredible. So could I ever live up to that? Or Somebody else's mom was, was much better than mine, and we wonder, is there any way that we can accomplish what God would have us to accomplish in our own homes as well as in our, our church? And there's really good news, and that is by relying on Him, by, by relying on our God, living a life of faith in Him, and just following after Him one step at a time, God makes our path straight. In other words, He leads us in the, in the places that we should go and down the paths that we should follow and when we look at these seven churches, we see that, that Jesus has a real stark warning to all of them, and that is it's very, very easy to take our eyes off the prize, to get our eyes off of what God would have us to, to do. There, there are just so many distractions, and uh, m most of us tend to be easily distracted. Even if there's something very important to us, there, there can be something that comes along that, that draws our attention away. And churches are, because they're made of people, are easily distracted as well. And thankfully, we have these seven letters to be a constant reminder to us of what the church is supposed to be so that week in and week out, we can remind ourselves of those things. And so let's look at two of those churches. We saw three last week. Let's look at two more of these churches this week. And we'll begin uh, reading in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. We'll read through the end of the chapter and then into the first six verses of chapter 3. I'll read aloud, and you can read silently, and if you don't have a copy of Scripture, you can find one in the back of the chair in front of you. Feel free to take that one with you whenever you go, and um, you can follow along here silently as I read aloud. Write to the angel, or the pastor, of the church in Thyatira. Thus says the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame, and whose feet are like fine bronze. I know your works, your love, your faithfulness, your service, your endurance. I know that your last works are even greater than your first works. 
But I do have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and deceives my servants to commit infidelity and to eat uh, meat that is sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her infidelity. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction unless they repent of their works and I'm going to strike down their offspring as well. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts and I will give to each of you according to your works. And I say to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching and who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan as they say, and that I'm not putting any additional burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. And he will rule them with an iron scepter, and he will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my Father, I also give him the morning star. Lest anyone, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to all of the churches. Now write to the angel of the church in Sardis and say this, Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and these seven stars, I know your works, I know that you have a reputation for being alive, but you actually are dead. Be alert, strengthen what remains, which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and what you have heard, and keep it and and repent. If you are not alert, then I'm going to end up coming like a thief, and you'll have no idea what hour I'm going to come on you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they're worthy. In the same way, the, ones, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so what we've seen so far in, these fir- in the first three churches is that Jesus warns the churches that uh, one temptation is to be a church that's known by its truth and its works, but not have any love. And it doesn't do you any good to have the truth, but without having love. Then there are other churches that in the midst of affliction are just not able to endure, that tough times come along and difficulty ensues and worldwide pandemics happen and uh, people walk away and they think, well, you know, now's my escape clause. This is a way for me to get out of, uh, you know, being a part of the people of God or, or participating in the life of the church. And, and so churches are sometimes tempted to turn our back when difficulty comes, when affliction comes. We think about our, our friends who are in the Ukraine right now and the difficulties that those Christians are facing there and we think stand firm stand strong and the the spirit of God is there to empower us and then we saw that there are some churches who are kind of all about the the good works and the love but forget about the truth and that none of these churches are healthy churches and that they they all end up missing the mark of what God would would have us to do that those churches who are like let's let's make sure we know what is true but don't love anybody are just as wrong as those who say well let's just kind of all love one another and and not believe the truth and not follow after the the scriptures. And so Jesus has warned those churches, look, listen, have ears to hear so that you can overcome. This whole picture in each one of these, in each one of these letters is be an overcomer. Like don't, don't end up falling short. Don't end up passing out on the side of the road. Don't end up not completing the journey and not running the race. I remember when I was in, in high school one year, I ran track. Now I've made a whole lot of bad decisions in my life and that's right up there near the top. And so someone talked me into running track. I was, I was not the slowest person in school. wasn't the fastest either. But, you know, the coach came and said, hey, look, why don't you come run track this year? And so I decided to do that. And he said, you're going to run the mile. If you added up all the running that I'd ever done, it may not have been a mile. And so the very first time that I was supposed to run in, uh, in a track meet, the very first time was to run the mile. And I woke up that morning and I thought, I haven't run before. I'd 
maybe I should do something. Maybe I should practice. And this was the morning of the meet. And so uh, I, I got up. I made my mom make me some pasta because I heard that pasta was good if you run. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's what I had heard. And so I had some pasta for breakfast and I, I ran like down to the end of the block and back again. I'm like, I feel okay with this. I think this is going to be, I think this is going to be fun. So I showed up at Theodore High School in order to run my very first mile ever in the history of my life. And uh, we took off, they shot the gun and, and we took off running. And I looked around and I was by myself. Everybody else had taken off and left me behind. And I was like, well, I can't run that fast. I have to do this four times around this, this thing. But I felt bad being all on my own. And so I tried to speed up and tried to keep up with everybody. And I thought, man, I'm at a full sprint. This is absolutely insane that this is happening. And the, the longer that we ran and the, the more my body just began to cramp up, like from top to bottom, it was, I couldn't breathe, I, I couldn't feel anything except just terrible pain and my, my hands hurt and my feet hurt and I was about one half of a lap in. It was a terrible experience. And as I fell back further and further, I got to know the other racers pretty well because as they ran past me every time, I'm like, well, hello, good to see you again, you know. And I just got further and further and further back and it, just, it was just hobbling along toward the end. And it was in the evening and it was a little dark outside and I was on one end of the track and everybody else was on the exact opposite, extreme opposite end. And I thought, now's my chance. And so I just stopped running. And I walked into the grass, and I kind of, you know, went walking up, and my coach was standing there, and he's looking around, and you can see him, like, where, where is my racer? And I walked in, like, hey, coach, how's it going? And he's like, why are you not on the track running? And I said, well, because I was dying, and I, I figured it would be better if we just walked up here. A reminder that my job was to finish, but I wasn't prepared to finish, and so I stopped. I quit before it ever happened. And I think every single race that I ran for the rest of that year, I finished early, um, meaning I stopped before I got to the end. I didn't, I, I didn't actually complete the race ahead of anybody, but I finished running ahead of everybody else, I can assure you, all, all year long. It, in the same way, it's not meant for those who run races to stop early before you accomplish your purpose. The same thing's true in the church. And if we aren't careful, what we can end up doing is, is not running the race to the end. Even if we start strong, we may end up getting, before we get to the finish line, getting tired of the race and pulling up early, getting off of the track. And Jesus writes seven letters to say, don't do it. Don't quit. Don't give up. There's something better at the end. And when I think about Mother's Day and I think about mothers, it's those who have said, I'm going to endure to the end. <laughs> There are, there are tough times, as some of the moms even mentioned before, some of the ladies mentioned before, that it, can be, it can be tough sometimes being a parent. When kids don't always do what they're supposed to do and you know, they don't sleep through the night when they're supposed to, about three nights after getting home when they're supposed to be sleeping through the night. And As they get older, the decisions that they make get even more complicated and more difficult. You have sleepless nights and you have wearisome days and you think, am I going to be able to do this? But you persevere and you press on. Because you know that the prize is better than the pain. That it's greater than the things that you face along the way. And that's what's true about being a Christian. Being a Christian church means being a place where people who face turmoil and tribulation and difficulty and challenge come together and we say, by the grace of God, by His power, by His indwelling Spirit, we're going to persevere and we're going to endure. And it won't be because we're good, but because He's good. It won't be because we're great, but because He is great. And these seven letters become that constant reminder to us. Don't quit. Don't give up. Persevere. Hang on. But along the way, on the journey, don't get distracted from what you're supposed to do. Don't look at the other people around you and wonder, why are they running faster than I am? You don't look and say, well, you know, why are they stronger than I am? Why do they look better than I do? Sometimes as Christians, we can not have ears to hear, and so we become deaf to what Jesus wants to say to us, and, and we replace what He's saying, His words, with the words of other people who speak into our lives, and they say, this is true about you, and this is true about your God. And if we aren't careful, we listen to the wrong voices, and in hearing those voices, we then get misled. We get not only distracted from what we are meant to be and what we are meant to do, but we get lost in the midst of the journey and we wonder where are we and where are we going and what is happening to us and so Jesus speaks very clearly to us 
And he says, I want you to hear my voice, to have ears that hear. When he writes this letter to the third church at Thyatira, he introduces himself as the one who has eyes that are filled with fire, that they're these flaming eyes. Now you wonder, what in the world is going on with this? Well, remember, the book of Revelation is filled with all sorts of uh, symbolism and imagery. And so when he describes himself as someone who has eyes that have fire in them, you have to think in terms of flames that come shooting out, right? It's like a a sci-fi movie or whatever. These are flames that come shooting out in order to accomplish a very important purpose. And that purpose is to purify That's what fiery eyes do, that they look beyond and and past those things which are impure, which are incomplete, and they seek to purify by burning up. That's why he says that he has feet which are fine bronze or pure bronze. In other words, he's the one who is pure, but he's not just pure, he's a purifier. I love this this way of thinking about God, that Jesus introduces himself to to us in that way. It It would be great to have a God who is pure. Right? To have a God who is perfect. But to have a God who is a perfecter and is also perfect is all the more meaningful to us. You see, one who is just perfect would look at us and say, be like me. Like, you should do better. You should be the way that I am. Sometimes parents can even be that way. If we aren't careful, we look at our kids and we're like, look at how great I am. You know, be like, be like me in the sense that I am great. And so we can be pure or perfect without being a perfecter or without being the purifier, without saying, you should be great and I'll help you. See, that's what parents do. They come alongside and and they're more than just the pure ones. They're more than just the perfect ones. They're the perfecting ones as well. It's not just watch me and do what I do. It's let me help you to be able to become the woman or the man that God would have you to be. And that's the way that our God is. He is both pure and He's a purifier. That He sees beyond all the dross in our lives, right? all the things that are our failures and our weaknesses and our imperfections, and He burns them away. The fire that comes out of His eyes is not to consume us, but to purify us. Be well aware of the fact that when Jesus comes to us with fire, it's not to harm us, it's to help us. It's to take all of those things in our lives that would keep us from being what God would want us to be and to burn them up, not to burn us up. For so many people who don't understand our God, they see this language of of fire and God, our God being a consuming fire and they think, oh my goodness, He's going to destroy us. He's going to take our lives from us. But He doesn't come to take our lives, but to give us lives by taking death away from us. And He burns death up, if you will. This imagery is so beautiful in the Bible that our God really is a consuming fire. And so when he writes to this church, to our church, and he says to us, I'm coming with with eyes that are a flame of fire, it means when he shows up, be prepared, because the things that don't correspond with the things of God are going to get burned up. And if you like those things, you're going to lose them. And if you hold on to them too tightly, your hands might get singed as well, that you might get burned too. So let go of those things as he removes them from us. Now, what he says about the church at Thyatira is very encouraging at the beginning. Again, this is the way that Jesus works in each of these letters. He says, let me give you the good, and then I'm going to give you the things that we need to work on. I'm going to give you the strength, and then I'm going to give you the weakness. And he says, what I know about you in verse 19 are these four things, that you have love, and you have faithfulness, and you have service, and you have endurance. Wonderful. Great. That you're, you're strong. Right? You've got the strength, you're in the race, you're running, you don't give up, you don't walk off like Steve does down at the end of the road, you keep running, you keep moving, that, that you don't give up, and you have love for each other. And when I look at your church, he says, Jesus says to the church at Thyatira, when I look at your church, that's what I see, people who love each other, who have all sorts of, of strength, who have all sorts of endurance, who serve one another uh, well and serve other people well, who are faithful to each other. I think this is such a great thing. What a beautiful church. Wouldn't you like to be that church? And the answer is absolutely you would like to be that church. But then what he says is, here's the, here's the warning, right? Here's the fear. He says, so this is what I have against you in verse 20, that you tolerate, not that you promote, but that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now, you may not be familiar with this woman Jezebel, but think about Jezebel as the anti-mom, right? So you have mom and you have anti-mom, and that's who Jezebel is. You can read about her in the book of 2 Kings. Now, you you may think, 
Okay, didn't know there was a first king, so much less a second one. But yeah, the second one comes right after the first one. And you can go and you can read the story of, of Jezebel. Jezebel was a woman, she's from the, this little town called Sidon, um, where God had warned his people, whatever you do, like don't go marry people from there. Um, in, in the Bible from uh, Cain and Abel, you remember this at the very beginning, you have Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve have a couple of kids, Cain and Abel, and Cain kills Abel. It's a, a story kind of makes its way even into popular, uh, in, into pop culture uh, as much as in the Bible. And so from in, throughout the Bible, from the beginning all the way through to the end, there are kind of two types of people, those associated with Cain and those associated with Abel. Abel, uh, those who worship God, follow God, love God, give themselves to Him. And then you have Cain, that is, those who would keep people from doing that. And so all through the Bible, you see this pattern that unfolds uh, all the way through. And it's usually two brothers who are against one another. Jacob and Esau is another one you might encounter when you read the, when you read the Old Testament. We sang a song earlier about the God of Jacob. That's what we mean. Jacob and Esau, two brothers, they fought, hated one another, that sort of thing. Well, by the time we get down to uh, the children of Israel, God told his people, now look, don't marry people from, uh, from Cain's w uh, place in the world, right? Those who would follow after Cain, um, like this town Sidon. And so Jezebel, who was from there, ended up marrying, though, the king of Israel. Right? His name was Ahab. And you think, okay, well, what's so bad about that? Well, besides the fact that God had told Ahab not to do this, and Ahab's like, nah, I know better. I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. I'll be okay. The warning all along was that if you marry someone who doesn't love me, someone who doesn't love God, who doesn't walk with Jesus, he's saying, what will happen is you're going to be tempted to leave your first love, that you're going to be tempted toward infidelity, Right, this notion of sexual immorality. You're going to be, be uh, inclined toward infidelity. You're going to worship other gods. You're going to serve other gods. And so what happens in the story of Ahab and Jezebel is that Jezebel, as the kind of anti-mom, the anti-prophet, the anti-god, what she ends up doing is getting the king to build a temple to a false god, to replace the temple for the true god with a temple for the false god that she uses her, the power of influence that she has over her husband to mislead not just him, but the entire nation and to lead them into idolatry. It's the reason why so often in the Bible, idolatry and immorality, that is adultery, go hand in hand. Because the picture is, as being in right relationship with God, that when we choose to follow other gods, that we're like an adulterous person, right? We're... we're in, uh, it, we're not being faithful to him. And so this infidelity is what Jezebel represents. And so it's not like there's a real person in this church named Jezebel. It's that the temptation is to tolerate infidelity. How might we see this in the church? False worship. False worship. What happens in this church in Thyatira and happens in so many churches is that people show up and, and they love each other and they're faithful to the church and we, they attend week after week after week and they serve one another very well and they endure and they persevere even when tough times come along. But what they allow themselves to do is to do all of the right things for the wrong God to serve the wrong God, to not participate in faithful worship, but unfaithful worship. The idea of Jesus having eyes that are flames is a picture that he sees into the, the reason why we do the things that we do. You see, on Sunday mornings, all that we see are our outward actions, right? We see what people say, we see what people do, we see how people act, but God sees the heart. And what he desires to do is to come and to purify our hearts so that we have faithful worship and not false worship. And so Jesus says to the church, don't listen to Jezebel. Don't hear her false teaching. Don't hear her false prophecy. Don't listen to the things that she says because she will lead you to the wrong God. And, and it doesn't do you good to have right worship of the wrong God. It, it's like getting the right answer to the wrong question on an exam. The teacher doesn't give you credit for that. You still, you still miss. And that's true here with Jezebel. And so he says to this church, don't listen to her. Don't tolerate her. Don't allow this kind of false teaching which would misguide you and lead you into infidelity. This reminds us, just the notion of infidelity reminds us that 
our relationship with God is just that. It's a relationship. We aren't here to just practice a religion where we say the right things and do the right acts and have the right hand signals when we're supposed to have them and practice the, the right handshake when we walk in the, in the doors. We're not the Moose Lodge. We're uh, the people of God who are here to worship Him. We are worshipers who are in right relationship with God as our God. He's not just a buddy who's down the street. He's not just a friend who shows up to, you know, we chum along with to tell us the, the ways that he thinks we ought to be living. He is this great God who has made us to be in right relationship with him and to enjoy the life that he gives to us. And so God calls us in this, in this letter to be the kind of church that participates in true worship by listening to the truth and not to falsehood. What God does in the story of Jezebel, and you can see it in 2 Kings chapter 9, is that God sends a prophet, the true prophet, who shows up to be the antidote to this, this failure, the one who shows up to provide the alternative to infidelity. This prophet gives the truth, and as those who respond to the truth believe it and embrace it, then their lives are spared. But those who give themselves over to idolatry, to infidelity, to worshiping false gods, they miss life. This is the notion here of saying that I'm going to throw this adulterous woman onto a couch and she's going to end up being destroyed by her own decisions, as it were. The symbol of that is that you and I, we have all sorts of choices that we can make. And if we choose to worship a false god, then when the, the storms come, that god is the one that has to save us. Well, if he's not real, it's not going to happen. And so if we give our lives to a God who is not the life giver, then when it comes to the end, there is no life for us to gain. Day in and day out in our lives, we make choices to either follow after the one true God and live a life of true worship or uh, worship of false gods. And even if we're in the right place, saying the right words at the right times, if our hearts are far from Him, there is no value in that. It's what the people of Israel find out all through the Bible. All through the Old Testament, they're told over and over, like, I hate the fact that you show up at church every week because you praise me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And this is the message for us. Let's not just say the nice things. Let's believe the nice things. And let's do the right things for the right reason so that our love and our faithfulness and our service and our endurance is because of our relationship with God, not our relationship with religion. Well, the next uh, church that Jesus writes to is the church at Sardis. They're beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. And this is what he says about this church. He says, you have a reputation of being alive. That would be a good reputation to have, right? So people look at the church and they're like, man, you're a, you're a church that has all sorts of life. And it's like, great, wonderful, glad to have this. And he says, yeah, but you're actually dead. You think you have it. You have it together. And when people look at you, it looks like you have it together, but you don't really have it together. Same thing can be true for us as Christians. We can give the appearance of having everything in place that we're supposed to have in place. And that when people look at us, they think, holy cow, she must really love Jesus. He must really love Jesus. But God knows the truth. And he tells us later in this passage, I want people to know I'm the one who sees into hearts. Like, I don't, I don't look at what you do on the outside. You don't impress me with the things that you do. And this is one of the dangers that we can get into as the church is we think God really likes the outward works that we perform. But it's not the outward works that matter. It's the inward. It is our behavior corresponding with a heart of love for God. And so he tells us, here's what you need to do. If the, if, if the fact of the matter is that you have a reputation of being alive, but really you're not, here's what you should do. Be alert and strengthen what remains. And I love the way that, that Jesus says this to the church. When you're reading the Bible, look for things, look for imperatives. Right? Look for when the Bible says, hey, go do this. Go do this other thing. And so the first thing he tells us is to be alert, to watch. To look around. Now, he's saying this to the pastor, right? Because he it says that he's writing this to the pastor in order to share this with the church, to be alert to what's going on. Have our eyes open to the truth the same way that Jesus sees the heart. We need to look into our own hearts in the same way that Jesus sees the truth. We need to look for the truth. And so he says, be alert. Don't be caught off guard by the fact that I'm coming again, he says. Because if you aren't alert, 
then I'm going to show up like a thief does. You know, the thing about a thief is they don't ever introduce themselves when they show up. They don't announce their arrival. They don't say, hey, by the way, uh, you know, breaking into your house now. <laughs> they sneak in so that you're not aware. And he says, if you're not looking for me when I show up, you're not going to see me. You're going to be caught off guard by what happens. Now, this is not just Jesus' return in the end, his second coming. It's like week after week when Jesus shows up. If we aren't careful, we miss him. Jesus is present in our lives in so many different ways, and we just miss the fact that he's there. We're so busy looking at other things and doing other things, not being alert and vigilant to recognize that he is, that he is present with us. But he says not only be alert, but also strengthen what remains. I love what he says here to the, to, to the church. There are those who have turned their back on the truth, he says. But for those who remain, strengthen them. This is what I love about the church. The, the church, the people of God, is the place to come to be strong, to be strengthened. It's what we do when we serve God faithfully, and we serve one another faithfully as we strengthen our faith. And there are a whole host of ways in which we do this. He gives us kind of a three-step process, if you will, in the next verse when he says this. He says, remember what you have received, keep what you have received, and repent when you don't do it. So this is what it's like to be strong. To be strong is to constantly be reminded of the gospel. Week after week after week, we open up the Bible and we're like, okay, what, did, what have we received? What have we been given? And we just remind ourselves of that. And then we leave this room together to go and live it out, to keep those things. We're like, this is what it tells us, and now I just go do it. And you think, well, I don't like that. Well, it's okay. I mean, you don't, we don't have to like it, but we go do it, and we go live that out. And then when we look at our lives, we're like, oh, I didn't keep that really well. Then I just turn from it. There's no secret formula. There's no complex set of, of, of formulas that we have to know. Walking with Jesus is a simple thing. Remember the gospel, what we have heard, what we have received from the scriptures and heard. And then keep those things, live them out. And when we don't turn from it, it's what the word repent means. It means like, just turn away to something else. And in so doing, our faith is strengthened and we grow in Christ. It's the goal and the desire for all of us as people of God is to grow, to be strong. I remember one time I was talking to, to a friend of mine that, that does um, uh, lawn care and uh, was asking him about my lawn and why I didn't have any grass there, uh, which was kind of the story of my lawn. I had dirt and crabgrass. And so I'm like, you know, I knew I have grab, crabgrass, which I guess is a kind of grass, but why can't I, why can't I get real grass to grow? What, what's the problem here? And he went through a handful of different things that I could do, and you got fertilizer and water and sun and, you know, a whole host of things that he said you have to have. But in the end, here's what he said, and it has stuck with me for for more than a decade since he said this because I said how do I get rid of the weeds and he said don't get rid of the weeds grow strong grass grow strong grass and I think about that every time I read a passage like this that in my own life the goal is not to just start looking for weeds and trying to spray them to get rid of them all but to grow strong grass don't make place for the weeds in my life and the same thing's true in the church Right? We, don't, we don't tolerate this false teaching. We don't listen to those who would say don't love. We don't pay attention to those who would say quit. And we're not just looking to get rid of all of the weeds. We're growing strong grass so that there's no space, there's no room, there's no ground for, grass, for weeds to grow because there's so much grass that's so strong. And that's what I want for you. And what I want for us as believers and as a gathering of believers that, that we're like strong grass. We're the yard where there's no room for weeds to grow up in our lives where the weeds can't come up and choke the life of Jesus out of you. And that's why he says, no, that when you endure, you're never going to be taken out of the book of life. Trust in him and follow him and walk with him. Remember what you have heard and keep it. Right? Listen to what he says to us and then live that out. And when we don't, just turn from it. Repent. And in so doing, because of our vigilance, we become strong. And that really is what I want for us. That you and I together, that we're strong. That we're strong grass so the weeds don't choke us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for this passage of Scripture, these two letters uh, which you wrote 
to the churches, uh, including our own church. And so we receive these letters as letters that have come from Jesus to us, and we listen to them. And we pray that by listening to them and by living them out uh, in a context of love for you and love for each other, that we might all be strengthened, that we'd be built up, that we would mature. So thank you for the time that we have together this morning to remember what we have received and to look for ways to keep that and to turn from our sins, to, to receive from you all that you offer to us. So thank you for this time together. And as we respond to it, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. If you want to talk with someone or pray with someone this morning, I would invite you to step out. You come now. We would love to talk with you and pray with you now as we sing. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for all, look at the Savior, and life more abundant and You know, before we go, and I, I'm just going to throw a curveball uh, to our praise team here, but can we just sing the chorus of that song one more time? Just a reminder as we go uh, to uh, keep in mind why it's so important for us to turn our, our eyes toward Jesus and to look into his face. So can we just sing that together over there, Danae? Are we good? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. much thank you so very much happy mother's day to all of you who are uh, who are mothers and i uh, hope you get to celebrate today if not i got two great moms at my house today you can come with us and you celebrate uh, mother's day with us so kiwi i think are you coming now to share a couple of thoughts and dismiss yeah. us yeah. great you and adlin yeah adlin's joining me this morning so yeah just a couple things uh one is an opportunity for all the ladies of our church no matter how old or how experienced you are in life this Thursday, we are having a ladies' fellowship. Um, it's an opportunity to come enjoy some desserts, some snacks, some coffee, and to enjoy getting to know other women at this church. Uh, we want to create space for you, if you're new here, to, to come and get to know some other women. And like some of the ladies in the video talked about, to get to know people that you can do life with. Um, another opportunity is for everybody next Sunday, we are gonna be having an opportunity to uh, remember the faithfulness of God and reflect on the history of Woodland. And so we hope that you can join us next Sunday and we're gonna have a meal, a fellowship meal following the service. And so kids 12 and under are free, but if you are above 12, we would love for you to sign up so that we can plan accordingly. Uh, you can do that by scanning the QR code in your bulletin or by signing up in the foyer or through the email that we send out during the week. So we hope that you will take advantage of both of those opportunities to build community this Thursday, 7 p.m. for the ladies and next Sunday for everybody. So will you join me in praying? Father, thank you so much for your incredible love. Thank you for the women in this church that um, are such a blessing. Father, we love you and we are grateful for your incredible presence in our life. Um, in Jesus' name, amen.